There's an American adage that says all politics is local. I know this phrase can mean a few different things, but if you're Arab, Muslim, and particularly Palestinian, you can reasonably take it a step further and argue that all politics is personal. And as activists, particularly those of us from marginalized communities, we know this is especially true, not only in our grassroots organizing work, but in how certain laws and unconstitutional practices by our government pose a direct threat to our individual freedoms. When we conjure the image of what America is, the vision is fairly clear. The image of rugged pioneers clearing an empty lot land to provide shelter to those who are persecuted. The image of up and coming lawyers and businessmen crafting ideas of rights and freedoms and establishing a government which would ensure that millions yet unborn would achieve freedom. We know these images. Despite our so-called politically correct society, these myths continue to pervade to give Americans a sense that they are exceptional and that the curtailment of rights and protections sustained by Muslims are just aberrations, necessary steps to protect the fragile flicker of liberty. But what these carefully crafted narratives leave out is that the curtailment of civil and constitutional rights is no aberration in our history. It is the cornerstone of the structure which has become the United States, and from the very beginning. Of course, we know of the theft of Native American lands, the deliberate destruction of Native tribes to sue colonization by English lords and venture capitalists. We know full well of the enslavement of 12 million Africans to provide free labor to build plantations and towns alike in North America to make the the continent suitable for European habitation. Yet even beyond these historic injustices, one needs to look no further than within these very colonies to see that the mirage of conservative and liberal thinking in America is built on the targeting and exclusion of a group. Consider that even within the first Plymouth colony in modern Massachusetts, figures such as Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams were monitored arrested, tried, and exiled based solely upon their belief that a colony founded upon tolerance for religious minorities should acknowledge or accept other dissidents, be they nonconformants, Catholics, Jews, and Muslims. From the very beginning, American authorities knew how to identify and attack the other. And not only this, but these same authorities utilized English common law court systems, and police authorities to make it happen. We cannot make the mistake of thinking that the mentality which eggs on politicians such as Donald Trump is a mob mentality. It is a cold, calculated use of common law, statutes, and due process to quash dissent. Now, I don't wish to recite the entire history of surveillance and repression, but rather to establish the fundamental point that suppression of the other in American society is part and parcel of the very society which mainstream individuals cling to, even those who claim to resist. You might know some of them. Fast forward to the early 20th century, and we add to the mix a new invention, the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation. From the very start, the FBI has been an organization dedicated to one purpose, the elimination of threats to American notions of liberal capitalist democracy. Indeed, the forerunner of the FBI was created within the Justice Department specifically to monitor the anarchist movement blamed for the assassination of President William McKinley, as well as bearing the responsibility for social disruptions such as the Haymarket riot. I would like to note that in its early days, a Republican-controlled Congress forbade the use of, secret, of the Secret Service agents by the Bureau of Investigation, as it was known at the time, for fear that they would be used as a secret police. And this was in 1908. Even as the courts expanded the power of industrialists over workers, segregated people of color from whites, even then politicians could see what could happen. But of course, the FBI came into being at a time of war. Yet it wasn't to fight the threat of Germans or Austrians during the First World War. It wasn't to prevent sabotage in a time of war. No, it gained power against two kinds of people, communists and war protesters. I'm sure there are none assembled here today.
But think about it. Despite the assertions that we were fighting a war to make the world safe for democracy, we began to empower a group of near-secret agents to quash individuals who never committed a crime, but to consider an alternative to liberal capitalism or the military-industrial complex. We know of the Palmer raids, the targeting of hundreds of political activists, protesters, and individuals with anarchist, socialist, and communist leanings. But we must remind ourselves that it was Congress which passed the Sedition Act. It was the courts which enforced provisions to arrest immigrants, whether they have documentation or not, and even stripped natural-born American citizens of their very status as, uh, as Americans, simply because they may identify with an ideological group based upon evidence they could never see, and, or simply rumors to which only federal agents could attest. The activities by, of ICE, which we see today, breaking up families, disproportionately enforcing flawed immigration regulations or losing children is not new. It has been around longer than we have had an anthem we are now called upon to stand up for at a, every event. Secret evidence, rendition, solitary confinement. It's as American as apple pie. And it, all of it is backed up by the full weight of congressional statutes, executive power, and judicial mandate. Even into the 1930s, when FBI agents became G-men and the enemies of America moved away from the red threat to Al Capone, we can recall that the battle against organized crime was as much to bolster the authority of the federal government at a time in which banks were failing, workers were organizing, and ordinary Americans began to lose their faith in capitalism. We cannot and must not separate economic and domestic concerns from the singling out of groups and their abuse at the hands of federal agents in a willing court system. One hand washes the other, and both wash the face. As the Depression grew deeper, unelected officials such as Hoover utilized public hysteria to gain surveillance powers over telephones, create criminal registries, begin to compile secret databases for those suspected of ties to criminals or dissidents. The result, as we knew too well, was the creation of a complex series of laws and institutions which enabled everything from, the Jap from Japanese internment to the House on American Activities Committee, or HUAC, to the surveillance and the infiltration of civil rights movement, to the destruction of empowerment groups such as the Black Panthers. Keep in mind that HUAC, COINTELPRO, and more took place at, at the exact same time as the Warren Court was handing out decisions expanding due process such as Gideon and Miranda. Of course, not all programs of surveillance or sabotage were court sanctioned, but neither did we see the kind of revulsion from, from federal courts at, that one would expect during times of great upheaval. Because at the core of the system, Preventing revolt matters more than preserving rights. Pre-9-11, pre-war on terror, pre-radical Islam, and pre-Trump. The system turned on its own before it turned on the rest. But let's fast forward to the experience of my community, which has been under attack for over two decades. Even today, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, and especially anti-Palestinian bigotry by a mainstream fig figure will almost never result in any serious backlash or sanctioning. For a number of years prior to 1996, the FBI and other government agencies, such as the Immigration and Naturalization, Nat Naturalization Service, or the INS, were pushing Congress to pass a law that would criminalize First Amendment activities centered on support for political groups in politically hot areas, such as the Middle East and Northern Ireland. In the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing in April 1995, these efforts had accelerated, culminating in the passage of the bill in Senate a month later with broad, with broad bipartisan support. And it was, I believe, um, 91 to 8. Um, this law was named the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Um, and it wasn't very hotly contested because it was pushed for at the time by Senator Bob Dole, who had presidential aspirations. And they exploited a lot of the fear and the hysteria and people's emotions after the Oklahoma City bombing. 
In the summer and fall of 1995, there were several meetings by those concerned about this law to discuss what appropriate response could be. These discussions involved my father, Professor Samuel Aryan, constitutional law professor at Georgetown, David Cole, CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and others, including Muslim and Arab groups who were concerned that they too could become targets of, their, of this law because of their political beliefs and associations. The executive order signed by President Bill Clinton in January 1995 also precipitated the targeting of political activists, especially those who were critical of Israel and the Oslo Accords. After some time in the, and in the heat of that year's presidential campaign, the legislation was passed in the House in April 1996, the Effective Death Penalty Act, the anti-terrorism. That same month, the INS arrested an Egyptian Muslim man named Nasser Ahmed during an immigration deportation proceeding and held him on secret evidence. His case was the first time the government had invoked the use of secret evidence, which is basically a constitutional violation as it denied the defendant his Sixth Amendment due process rights. In essence, the government would meet with an immigration judge behind closed doors and without the presence of the defense, provide him with the alleged evidence, which in many cases was hearsay or political associations hyped up as support for a terrorist group. The judge would then ask the detainee to defend himself against evidence that he couldn't see um, an impossible task. After the passage of this law, the tactic was used more frequently. Between April 1996 and April 1998, 29 cases in which defendants were held on secret evidence were documented. 28 of those were Arabs and Muslims. In May 1997, the political once again became personal when my uncle, Dr. Mazen al a Palestinian refugee and scholar who had been residing in the U.S. since 1991, living at the time in Tampa, Florida with his wife and three American-born daughters, was arrested and became another casualty of secret evidence. His case became one of the most famous examples of government's abuse of power after repeatedly denying him his Sixth Amendment rights. The INS targeted and detained my uncle, who had no criminal record and was an academic because of, because, um, of his First Amendment uh, protected activities. At the time, he was involved in an Islamic think tank and a charity which the Justice Department labeled as terrorist activity. It is important to add that my uncle, who was a stateless Palestinian born in Gaza, was initially denied his bid for political asylum and later promised citizenship and freedom in exchange for informing on or testifying against my father since the government was unable to build a case against him because there were no illegal activities to speak of. Following my uncle's arrest, a local group called the Tampa Bay Coalition for Justice and Peace was formed to lead the struggle to free him. A national coalition formed in response to the secret evidence crisis and included not only many local defense committees of Arab victims of secret evidence who are all over the country, but also um, Northern Irish defendants who were threatened with the same unconstitutional practice um, until all were freed uh, during the Good Friday Accords in 98. While the, coalition while, the, while the coalition included traditional civil and constitutional rights groups, such as the Center for Constitutional Rights, the National Lawyers Guild, and the First Amendment Foundation, it notably assembled all the major Arab and Muslim institutions, including the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, or ADC, the Arab American Institute, the American Muslim Alliance, the American Muslim Council, CARE, MPAC, MASS, and others. My father, who, is, who eventually would face an even bigger legal battle on his own, was elected as the coalition's first, and as it turned out, only president. More than 30 groups joined at the time. In total, my uncle would spend five years in prison without charge or the ability to confront the so-called evidence against him before he was eventually deported in 2003. But as it turned out, the political empowerment and mainstream engagement of American and Muslim, uh, of Arab and Muslim American institutions, which made significant gains in their efforts to end the use of secret evidence, 
including a bill in Congress with bipartisan support to repeal its use, subjected the community and its leadership to a hostile campaign by neoconservatives and powerful interest groups, particularly from the Israel lobby, with its unfettered access to the media, the intelligence community, and law enforcement agencies. To give just one example, in my father's terrorism case, um, a March 2003 article in the foreword stated that the Israeli government had provided the U.S. government with all the evidence that the FBI used in its case against him and his three co-defendants, all of whom were of Palestinian origin. Like other marginalized communities, the government's scrutiny of American Muslims intensified as they became more organized, visible, and vocal in defending their rights and engaging fellow citizens. Naturally, the American Muslim community became the target of COINTELPRO, which, as you know, oper operated in the 1950s for two decades through surveillance, infiltration, and political disruption by the FBI. All of you here today likely know the history of the counterintelligence program as it was first used on the, on the Communist Party, the Socialist Workers Party, the black community, the Latino, and eventually the Arab community. And to borrow from one of the most brilliant political minds and dynamic American Muslim leaders, Dr. Aga Saeed, the aims and application of COINTELPRO, whether on other vulnerable communities or Muslims, can best be summarized in six points. When a community is targeted by COINTELPRO, law enforcement, particularly FBI, seeks, number one, to undermine its leadership. This is through building cases against them, arresting them, deporting them, um, and just creating uh, fear and hysteria in the community that would basically uh, cause them to be pariahs. Number two, to undermine its legitimate organization, there's no clearer example than the case of the Holy Land Foundation Five, which you'll hear about next, um, where it, it was the largest Muslim American charity and it was destroyed due, based on its immense success. That's really the only reason. In going after the HLF, the government chose to name 307 American Muslim individuals and organizations as unindicted co-conspirators in a terrorism case. Our community isn't that big. 307 individuals and institutions, that's basically everybody. And there's no legal recourse to challenge this designation. You're, you're forever um, you know, tarnished by it. Number three, to control the agenda of the target community. One example is the Black Panther Party, um, which as documents, uh, declassified documents revealed, uh, after its leaders were shot dead, arrested, or smeared in personal attacks. Um, the party and the community was eventually infiltrated and replaced with leadership that altered the agenda. We're seeing this happening now with the Muslim community, where um, you, know, you have this good Muslim, bad Muslim um, you know, uh, dichotomy. The good Muslim is the one that upholds these, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the government's agenda and it's, and, it, it, you know, and uh, it paints the dissidents as being the bad Muslims. Uh, number four, to create fear and disunity in the target community, primarily through fear or smear campaigns, similar to the one against Care Now. That's the largest civil rights uh, Muslim organization in the country, which has been labeled as a front for the Muslim <coughs> Brotherhood. Uh, to deny the community access to the mainstream press and to the halls of power and influence being completely blacklisted, you can't publish in the mainstream, you can't, you don't have invitations to the White House, to the State Department, it's pretty much closed to you, which is in violation of your rights as a citizen to be able to engage with your lawmakers. And number six, to deplete the community economically through legal cases and lawsuits that cost millions of dollars to defend against. And we've seen this happen. So this is the essence of what the community has been subjected to over the last two decades much of it driven by Islamophobia and a biased U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Ironically, as Dr. Saeed, a law-abiding citizen and professor of political science, was giving presentations around the country on COINTELPRO of the Muslim community, years later, The Intercept revealed that he and a handful of other law-abiding American Muslims were under illegal, warrantless NSA surveillance for years. In my father's case and many other non-citizens, it was the FISA wiretaps, always approved, always renewed, 
that subjected our entire family to constant surveillance for over a decade that we know of. Today, we see these same abusive tactics continue against Black Lives Matter, animal rights, and environmental rights activists, among others. Um, and next, I'll turn, it, oh, I'll turn it over to Miko Pellet, who will discuss the outrageous case of the Holy Land Foundation Five, while Mel will speak about my father's case, both of which, while pursued since the early 90s, were only made possible to criminally prosecute following the hysteria that engulfed the country in the aftermath of 9-11. In what has become an unremitting, nearly two decade long war on terror, Professor David Cole early on observed a real problem in this policy, which has spanned the last three administrations. He said this dragnet approach has targeted tens of thousands of Arabs and Muslims for registration, interviews, mass arrests, deportation, and automatic detention in effectively treating an entire overwhelmingly law-abiding community as suspect. Such broad measures deeply <coughs> alienate the targeted communities, making them far less likely to assist law enforcement efforts to identify the actual perpetrators. But there's perhaps no greater truth than his observation one year after the, the horrific attack <coughs> when he said, it appears that the greatest threat to our freedoms is not posed by the terrorists themselves, but by our own government's response. Thank you.